Welcome to Talent Summit 2022. We are two weeks out from the conference and this year's theme is work in progress. It's very much that, Suzanne, isn't it? It is, Robbie, and thanks for um, inviting me onto this session today. Yeah, good to see you. So for those who don't know you, um, Suzanne McVeigh is the marketing director for globalization partners across EMEA, I think, Suzanne. Uh, yeah, I started yeah. here. So we're actually headquartered in Boston, but I started here in July 2020 um, to set up the marketing operations um, from the EMEA standpoint. Super. So we've partnered with you for some time on several fronts, Suzanne. And for those who don't know the organization, uh, globalization partners you guys were the pioneers of the employer of record service initially and i know you now offer through an ai backed platform uh, you're the la largest provider of employer of record um services uh, in the world with operations in 187 countries and you you made headlines here in ireland when you guys invested in the first instance back in 2020 uh, and more recently with your most recent round of funding, which gave you guys a valuation of 4.6 billion, where you caught the world's attention, Suzanne. Uh, it's gone from strength to strength, it seems, given the external context and also the demand for your services. Yeah, it was a fantastic way to start the year to get 250 billion um, and also 200 million uh, funding. So what a way to kick off the year. And as you said, Robert, yes, we were the pioneers in the industry. So our CEO, Nicole Sahin, she actually used to do this job herself. So about 10 years ago, um, she started to go and work with companies and set up different entities for them in different countries. And then she realized that, you know, there was a business there. Um, so what our employer record model actually does is usually, you know, the means to test a new market or to employ talent in a new country, people think that they need to go down the route of setting up a branch or um, or entity. So what our employer record model does is we're the ones with the entities. So we can cover 187 countries, and you can find you you find talent, and we help you you help you with the talent, and you come onto our platform, and we look after everything for you. So we can have somebody hired in a different country for you in less than like 48 hours. We look after the compliance, the tax, the HR, the benefits. You don't have to worry about any of those headaches. We look after it and you just can concentrate on more strategic and um, more focused different initiatives that you have going on. Yeah, and how timely is it? Like you've clearly gone from strength to strength over the last two years in particular, it seems. What are you spending the money on that you raised? So marketing. So yeah, it's great. <laughs> we, we, can, um, you, we can try out a lot of different campaigns and we can test a lot of different channels. So I don't know, I think you were talking to me last week about you seeing some of our billboards in different countries. So we have a lot of billboard advertising and out of home advertising, and we're trying to really get our name and our brand out there across all of the different countries in May. And it seems to be working now. We're getting a lot of pictures of billboards on slacks and it's great to see. Well, your reputation precedes you. I was traveling through uh, Amsterdam two weeks ago and uh, every time I turned, uh, I saw an ad and I was watching the Winter Olympics, in fact, and I saw a lot of your TV advertisements as well. So power to you. Um, I, I'd like to talk to you about some of the themes that we're going to cover as part of Talent Summit. Um, we're really excited for this, Suzanne. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's likely to be one of the largest gatherings of HR leaders in Europe uh, over the last two years. It's certainly going to be the largest in Ireland. Um, and I think we're going to capture a moment in time where our community... Uh, want to convene are allowed to and now have the confidence to do so so we're delighted to partner with you on it and to get the gang back together uh, but the first theme I'd like to explore and the question I have for you I want to talk about the broad trend we're seeing around talent shortages so we call it the talent talent shortage economy um, and there's two ends to the spectrum if I just frame it and then I'd love your view on it so on one hand we have the lower skilled workforce for high touch work. So those who are required to be in person in maybe hospitality, logistics, retail, and so on. And then we have the other end of the spectrum, which are the higher skilled for low touch work, where remote work is a very viable option. I think we're seeing on one end of the spectrum, 
a lack of supply of talent into the country. And then the other end of the spectrum, we're now starting to see the great resignation bite hard in Ireland. What trends are you seeing globally, given the breadth and depth of the insights that you see to your customers in the countries where you operate? Great question, Robert. And you know what? I love this question. But first of all, I'd like to just talk about your event and how excited we are. Number one, to be at an event in Dublin. It's in great, Boston. isn't it? <laughs> I know we did this event yeah. last year together online and we got a great yeah. um, audience. And, you know, it was just such a great event. But now to actually have it face to face where we can, um, you know, talk to each other and talk to our, our you know, audience there is just so exciting. So to answer your question, so I think there's two trends that we're seeing at Globalization Partners. A good place to really begin is, um, you know, for company leaders building teams in post-pandemic world, where the entire workforce has really moved to a virtual, you know, standpoint anyway, and they're fully professionals at being remote, there's two questions that really spring to mind. So why not hire the best talent anywhere in the world if you can find it? Mm. And the second is why not take advantage of top tier skills in a lower cost jurisdiction? So our opinion at GP, uh, you know, is, is something that we're, you know, uh, our whole campaign really in Q1 is like testing this. We don't think that there's a talent shortage. We actually think that the talent shortage is a myth. Throughout the month, <laughs> Go on, hit me. So, Talent is available everywhere. Companies just need to really start thinking differently and more particularly globally. So as you mentioned in your two scenarios, what we are seeing, what we're actually seeing when we talk about talent shortages in it, is that there are local talent shortages in local location specific roles mm. or certain industries like you mentioned, like retail or hospitality and manufacturing. So there is a clear demand and supply imbalance because the roles are location dependent. But if you look at it from a global perspective and knowledge worker perspective, yeah. there is no talent shortage. The talent shortage is out there. So according to a study that you know, Oxford Economics did in 2021, there was many countries like US, Canada, Russia, Japan, Australia, that there was a lack of local talent in 2021. So on the other side of the spectrum, we've got nations such as India, Indonesia, South Africa, Brazil, um, Morocco and Colombia, that they're experiencing the opposite. They've got mm. a surplus of local talent. So, you know, I think it comes down to the abundance of college educated professionals in these emerging markets will really emphasize the importance of expanding your talent acquisition strategies across borders, causing a global shift in where industrialized nations look for new and skilled talent. So this trend would be one trend uh, that we're seeing, and then the ease with which companies can hire globally by using you know, even different platforms like the one that we offer ourselves is one that we see been a big trend as well, which will impact the international workforce in 2022 and beyond. It's funny, isn't it? The evolution, like, like I think it's fair to say the great remote experiment by and large has worked for knowledge-based workers. And again, the shift that we would see is like this old adage that work is clearly no longer somewhere you go. Um, but it's also no longer something you simply do. It's now something that needs to find you. So opportunity looks to find talent wherever it may reside. But I wonder, are we committed enough, having been through this over the last two years, to fully understand the kind of the long-term kind of impact of deeply isolated remote work and what impact that will have on our people and indeed on society? Do you guys have any sense of that? Well, I think, you know, um, there's just been such a fundamental shift in the way that the whole... Mm world of work has changed over the last you know 12 to 18 months and there's so many different things that are happening at the moment but you kind of touched on it um it's really an employee's market now or a candidate's yeah. market they're the people that are you know writing the job description that they want in their head before they even go to the recruitment agencies and um you know look for jobs everything has changed everything is more flexible um, and 
what you said as well, like it's more than just a job now. People need to connect to the culture. I know culture is like something that we talk about all the time uh, here at uh, GP, but they need to connect the culture to their values. They need to connect the flexibility to their work-life balance. There's so many different things that have changed um, or have been emphasized over the last 18 months. I think this is going to continue. And, yeah. um, you know, it's hard to know where the future will go, but uh, I think hybrids will be, you know, more you know, people are going remote working, but then all of the surveys that I'm looking at, a lot of the companies and the workers are actually, um, you know, suggesting that it's hybrid model that they want. So companies need to be able to adapt to these wishes um, of their employees and really listen to what uh, they're saying. Yeah, no, it's true. The, the analogy I often use, Suzanne, is like as employers, we've been through this long distance relationship with our employees over the last two years. And what happens with long distance relationships, Suzanne? They can fall apart. They do quite often fall apart. And that's what's happened, I think. I think the uh, they've fizzled out in many cases. And I think the uh, our employees have been opened up to a whole new world of experiences, a whole new, literally a whole new world of opportunity. And if I stick with the kind of relationship, analogy it's like online dating all of a sudden becoming a very real thing and there's, there's there's a couple of things on the horizon that again would concern me and we're seeing this play out in the recruitment market um again we've never seen demand like this in in 20 years and it's sustained at record-breaking demand um and i think we'll see a lot of good conversation around this at talent summit um but now with the option to return once more i think we kind of had a a bit of a kind of a window um, to, to, to reunite and to return to the office uh, a couple of months back. Uh, but now it seems fairly sustainable. And again, I heard Joe Biden yesterday encourage employers uh, to, uh, again, bring their employees back to the office. Um, and us bringing our folks, the long distance partner back to give it a shot once more in the office. Uh, I think two things will happen. Like you pointed out the sh power shift from employee sorry, from employer to employee, but also the loyalty piece is also being fractured. Again, I think the loyalty is now is lesser to the employer and the brand, and is more to the daily experience of work. And how we identify with our working selves has changed. So the psychological contract of work itself has changed. And I wonder, Suzanne, is this a one-way door we've been through or is it a two-way door? And what's likely to happen to that hybrid workforce, will it reduce? Will we see more days in office as people settle back in? Or have we got used to the routines, to the rituals and to the benefits of remote working? Do, do, do you have any sense of how that pattern might play out between in-office, full-time remote and hybrid? Do you see any growth in any of those segments? Yeah, I think like it's very interesting how, how everything has changed. Um, I think really it's it's down to looking at the individual and catering for the individual. Um, I think some a company that has a blanket approach to okay, you have to be back in the office or you know you have to be hybrid. They will see retention of employees. Um, they'll mm. see the differences in these numbers because. If you were somebody that was five minutes away from the office or 10 minutes away from the office and, you know, didn't have one hour commute each way, it's fine to go into the, the hybrid um, or even the full time office environment. But a lot of people have realized that they're saving, you know, 10 hours a week sometimes in commuting. And if companies enforce these type of strategies that they have to be in, they could lose really, you know, experienced and um, fantastic people. So I think it's really having a strategy that uh, caters for everybody's needs. Um, but then making sure, like, you know, I could talk for a long time about hybrid. We have a fantastic um, ebook on, on like the whole hybrid cycle. But <clears throat> if you were to, you know, set up hybrid as your model, you really need to look at having a proper build out strategy. And if you know, you don't want people to, you know, be in the situation where there's have and have nots. Okay, mm -hmm. there's people that are coming into the office and any favoritism for people that are coming in versus people that are staying home. 
Um, so whatever model that you choose, I think to really like look at what the strategy is behind it. And it also comes down then, everything comes down to culture, all of these conversations. Um, if it is a hybrid model, you know, it's really about a shared purpose. You know, whether you're at home or you're working in the office, you need to have a shared purpose <coughs> together that will bring you together. You need to have accountability. You need to have transparency. And then you need to have like leaders that are really easy, accessible, and like really, um, you know, prevalent in all different areas, whether it be in the, in mm -hmm. the office or at home. So I think, you know, it depends on the person and the companies that try and enforce one way or the other will kind of suffer the consequences. It's funny, like people are asking how much flexibility can you or should you provide? Frankly, it's as much as being demanded in the marketplace. Um, and it's funny, we think of flexibility as place quite often, don't we? Like, like I think of three baskets when I think of the kind of world of work, workforce, workplace and work practice. Work practice is the glue that binds both. Um, and we often think of where we work when we think of flexibility. But I think how uh, and when we work are two key components of flexibility. And for everybody that's deeply individualized uh, and again you happen to know my wife i found out yesterday uh, who she 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 she, she crawled into the room here and you <laughs> spotted each other and had a moment it was great to see her after all this time you were in school together it was gas um and um but the little patterns I have when I work from home, I pop down to see the girls when I went from school. I'll say a quick low, catch up on the day and pop back up to the office. So my work patterns, and again, I'll get up early before Kelly goes to the gym uh, and I'll get an hour and a half done um, again. And then I'll plug in with the kids for an hour or so. And then I'll get back um, back to the desk, you know. But if people receive my kind of emails and stuff like that at, say, six in the morning, they might feel that urgency or need to respond. So I think understanding they're like a service level between colleagues and how you collaborate and those work micro work patterns for kind of macro work are really what enable kind of as you say like transparent collaboration like sustainable performance and a constant yeah, well quite the opposite in fact not a need like, like not feeling the need to always be on and always having to respond so that's a like close quarter localized understanding of the patterns of work amongst the team and you mentioned leadership i think that comes down to how leaders stitch those patterns together uh, and i think for kind of low touch work we need high touch leadership um, and just my final point on culture i think you, you really hit the nail on the head there i think when we think of culture Historically, it's how we experience the shared behaviors in an environment. Um, so it has always been, um, I guess, influenced by place and those in the place. And that's a hearts and minds piece, you know. So cognitively, you're thinking, you're engaged, you're 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 you're, you're channeling, but you also feel, and I think it's an output of that collective behavior that you feel, and that's what we interpret as culture. And as we've shifted into it, like a distributed working world, we no longer feel that. And we need to lean more on, as you say, purpose, like shared common purpose, more on ideology and, 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 and less on place. And that's a very different wiring that's required to make sure that everyone kind of identifies with that, is energized by that and leans into that. Because if it's guided by values, which is what you mentioned, Suzanne, I'd ask employers this question. Which of your values stood up most when they were, were required over the last two years? And which were stressed most? And I would ask every employer, like before we went into this pandemic, how much did you genuinely value, say the healthcare the well-being of your people, and I guarantee you that is elevated and is a much, a much more prominent value now than it was two years ago. So I think we need to go to an overhaul of those value sets as we come out of the pandemic, what that means to our people, 
and how they lean into this ideology that's guided by the values because the All Blacks, the highest performing sporting team um, in the world in any sport until we beat them twice recently, um, how they identified with their performance. They never had a home ground. They were always rotating to different training facilities and they were very much about ideology. Um, so culture, I think, feeds in in so many ways, doesn't it, into recruitment and retention. Yeah, you know what, Robert, I could talk about culture all day long. I, you know, it's something that's really dear to my heart. And um, even when we recruit people, you know, we're on such a hiring spree at the moment. It's fantastic, you know, how much we've grown over the last while. A lot of my, you know, week is actually spent interviewing people and um, building up the European team. So when I am interviewing them, <clears throat> I'm probably looking at, you know, may, maybe it's not 50-50, but it's definitely a big chunk that, okay, they have the experience, they have the skills, mm. they have everything that we need in that way. And then I'm looking at culture and I'm looking at our values. So we have really special culture here at GP and our values, you know, have grit, open to constant change, make an impact. And, you know, we're actually... Uh, the team, the global dream team, as we call them, are just super nice human beings, supportive, helpful, and everything like that. So it's really important to think about this culture fit when you're at the interviewing stage, as well as, you know, um, when we're hiring and, and training of people and, 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 you know, doing things, you know, the different types of cultural events. So that really starts at interview stage and then making sure, going back to the leadership, mm. that it's the leadership that's driving the culture and that there's programs and um you know that they're building the culture with specific programs and um looking at what their values are and how they can how they can bring that in as well so i think you know from the cultural standpoint it's such, it's such an important part you know to get it right especially you know usually it's companies that they go over 100 that they might get the culture diluted and you know throwing um hybrid working and remote working, it can dilute even more and throw in even more curveballs. We have a culture committee here at um, Globalization Partners. We're always, uh, you know, creating really nice events, inclusive events. We're all about diversity here. So it's really important to have a strategy for your culture as well as just, you know, showing your values and, and um, you know, looking at, what you can do every day to support this area. Um, but yeah, culture is just so important to a company, especially in a grown company where you're, where you're recruiting and you want to really get the right um, people to help but, you expand. Yeah. Uh, and you know something, you mentioned your global dream team. I happen to have worked with several of them and collaborate with, 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 with many of your colleagues internationally. Um, and I've experienced a very consistent, warm experience. I don't know what guides that. I don't know what the secret sauce is. Um, but as a, an external partner, I find it a very warm thing. So again, I don't again I don't go and go too deep into it. But but if I experience it that way as an external partner, I often think about what's driving the competitive advantage for employers. And I think what we've been through over the last two years, in one way, there's been a great self leveling of competition. So not just people competing within kind of in the commuter belt uh, or a certain proximity but also I compare ourselves say Sigmar to like probably our biggest uh, our biggest competition is uh, and are kind of US multinational tech companies who are some of the most probably attractive employers in the world because we have a very heavy concentration of them here in Dublin um, and we choose not to compete uh, on certain things um, but I think the last two years like this kind of six star office uh, experience uh, is no longer what people visualize as being or creates the kind of culture. It's much deeper than that. Uh, so it'll probably create a bit of a level playing field. But I look at the common mistakes a lot of our clients make. Um, and again, there's a couple of things that we would often kind of recommend, Suzanne, you know, so I think time is simply the biggest killer of all deals. Um, and I think there's a way we can short circuit that without compromising the quality of our hires. Uh, I think given, I, I, I don't think it's a bit, I think locally and nationally, which is still, I think how a lot of Irish companies think 
when they hire. Um, they don't think as globally, say, as some multinational companies. And there lies an opportunity, by the way, Suzanne. But I think when they look locally or look nationally, um, quite often they are somewhat blinkered to external talent. And the biggest barrier for them onboarding top talent is quite often themselves. Um, I know how critical it is to two top challenges for businesses globally are recruitment and retention, the two biggest challenges. And if the internal alignment of all stakeholders and managers isn't clear that everything else takes second priority to those challenges, well, they're not going to get the best talent because what quite often we get mixed messages internally and we get, again, a very mixed experience for our candidates, for example, based on kind of, again, very simple expectation management and very simple kind of comms and experience uh, and quite often a lack of experience of consistency within that experience and um, so they quite often fall for one person but also get knocked back by somebody else so there's timing there's also the experience and how they um how they how they engage with the folks is is also i think letting some employers down um but i think ultimately we think about the employer value proposition like you mentioned the loyalty has changed the power shift has changed like we shouldn't think about it in terms of the employer value proposition like it moved to like the work value proposition what does it look like to me working at home who do i work with who do i interact with what impact do i have how am i measured how can i perform and what does it feel like to collaborate with those people in that context and i think now it's moving into an experience value proposition which is deeply individualized. So as I try and hammer a big corporate employer value proposition, or what I care about is my daily experience of work, there's going to be a mismatch. So I think the communication, the messaging to begin with quite often isn't aligned and people are going out um, with a very broad overarching broadcast as opposed to that personalized nearcast, uh, which ultimately creates the opportunity to engage with the talent because we know where they are. We've all the platforms in the world to tell us that, but deserving the right to engage is the first step. And quite often we miss that. Uh, but you guys are building out a whole global supply chain of recruitment enablement. Suzanne, tell us about that. Yeah, so we've just launched uh, our product, GP Recruit. So um, before to that, uh, we we were really looking after setting up, you know, all the compliance and HR, and it was up to the uh, the company to find their own talent. And now we do the whole 360. So we cover everything from finding um, the talent to setting them up. And then obviously when they're set up, we have 24 hour, um, you know, support from a HR standpoint. So we look after all the HR benefits, you know, after um, they're hired as well. So there's a really, you know, exciting part to our product uh, this year that we just launched as well. Yeah, so this quarter, we've, we've had a lot of good news. Uh, so we do the whole 360. Global dream team. 360. It is a dream team, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, you know what, Robert, just like wanted to go back to your conversation there on retention, because this is a huge topic uh, and something that we we're looking at all the time. We're, we're so lucky now, we have a super high level of retention here. Um, I'd like to say in, in the 90s for Europe anyway, I'm not sure of the North America figures, um, but not many people have left GP um, from the sales and marketing side since we started in July 2020. So long may that last. And do you know why I think it is? So there's kind of three reasons. The first is onboarding. So you know you have one uh you have one time to make your first impression and it starts at onboarding and onboarding actually starts in the interview process um so you have to make the onboarding so smooth so i started in the middle of the pandemic um and you know i got the laptop delivered to me i had a two-week timetable before i started exactly what my first two weeks would look like who was i going to meet what was the agenda it was such a nice way into the company. And I just had that reassurance. Oh yeah, I've definitely made the right choice here. Mm. And it's been like that ever since, like really good plans, training. Um, I know exactly what my objectives are. We have a very, you know, uh, set in stone plan and performance review and all that kind of stuff. And it started from that stage. So I always knew what I had to do, 
who I needed to go to if I had any blockers. And, you know, just even having that feeling from day one is a huge way to retain your Point, employees. Yeah where they feel valued, utilized, and they're kind of nourished as well for, for their values or, you know, well for what their, their work job is going to be. And then two other things I think obviously is, you know, creating a healthy work-life culture. And, um, you know, there is, people are super busy and it's never always going to be nine to five, nine to six. But what you mentioned before, flexibility, okay, if you want to pop on in the evening instead of taking a couple of hours in, uh, during the day, like just having that flexibility. Nobody wants people to be burned out and we want to do everything um, in, in our power to make sure that that doesn't happen. And then also coming from the leadership to communicate and um, that this is what our policy is. And then lastly, really to build human connection. So we're talking about hybrid models, remote working uh, in the mm -hmm. office. There's lots yeah. of different ways to look at it. And then you're thinking about proximity. Um, so like proximity is usually, in, you know, uh, you know, face to face or like that closeness, but you can actually create that closeness in a virtual situation yeah. as well. You just have to really, I think, you know, tune in, listen to what your employees are saying or what they're not saying, but what they're saying, you know, if uh, they're not directly saying it to you, mm. turn off the phones and really like listen to them and have one to ones. Um, and I think they're the three main keys to retaining your employees in 2022. I mean, there's probably a lot more, but they're the ones that we're concentrating on um, here at GP. And we have some really good uh, you know, staff on that so far. That's really cool. That's really interesting. And again, that is one of the kind of, I think, the main themes that we'll, we'll kind of uncover and unpack at Talent Summit next week. You know, and I think like recruitment, the evolving competitive advantage for global recruitment will be one of the key themes. I'm looking forward to hear Mark, your colleagues speak on that. Um, I knew of him before he joined you, in fact, you know, and again, is very well respected, certainly within our industry in recruitment globally. Um, so really looking forward to his insights. Um, and yeah, unpacking this myth, which again, I see it quite differently locally, but uh, I'm looking forward to being educated and hear the insights. Uh, retention is clearly another one, but you mentioned um, this challenge between well-being and well doing. So we've Gary Keegan, he's the high performance coach for the Irish men's rugby team in conversation with Julian French, who's the uh, employee experience expert in residence with Work Vivo. So that's gonna be a fascinating conversation. We have another big announcement now to come this week, um, which I think is gonna kind of move people on the day. Um, and then we have a, a whole kind of group of folks over from the US, from the UK, from across Europe, in fact, you know, but we've a delegation from NASA coming in again to talk okay. about their journey. Yeah, okay. really cool, really cool. Um, actually, we're talking to, um, we're talking three years ago, um, we had a conversation uh, having dinner and we're talking about uh, remote working and there was somebody at the table saying, oh, I've got employees in Wexford. And we're also, oh, I've got somebody out in Castle Knock and we're trying to kind of show off how kind of, how remote we were before the pandemic. <laughs> and um, Bob, who's come over from NASA, was at the dinner and he just put his hand up. He goes, um, I've got folks in the outer space. I think we win, you know, so <laughs> it was no competition. <laughs> yeah, the most remote <laughs> workplace. And the other one I'm looking forward to, and I'd love your view on this as well, uh, Lynn Odlum. She was the chief people officer with Zoom. Um, and she's just started a new role. It hasn't been announced yet. One of the most exciting tech companies uh, in the US. Um, her two kids also work in HR, um, Wallace and Whitney. Uh, Whitney works in Peloton. Uh, and then we have Wallace who works for DoorDash. So we're going to have a conversation around the intergenerational view of the evolution of HR from three experts working for three really exciting organizations within one family. Um, so we're titling that one, Not in Front of the Children. For Isn't sure. it? No, it's cool. It's really cool. They wrote a blog about it and we said we'd bring it and we'd bring it to life. So they're coming over from the States. And I was just thinking the Peloton there, we have uh, the Chief Future of Work Officer from SAP, um, Christian Schmeichel, talking about their, um, their pledge to flex model that's enabled this individualized work for over 100,000 employees across the world. He's going to share insights and how they did that. And uh, the working title we gave this one, Suzanne, was uh, Flex in the City. And it was only after me, it occurred to me, we got somebody from Peloton, we're talking about Flex in the City. And I just think, and I think we got this one wrong, you know? Uh, so we have a super lineup. Is there anyone you're looking forward to seeing? Uh, 
Uh, well, I do have to give a plug to uh, our own talent shortage, Mark Headley, our VP um, of talent acquisition. But I mean, there's a few people. There's uh, Wendy Moorhead, who's yes. from our partner, Ceridian, yeah. um, competing for Hearts and Minds. And then I saw Johnny Campbell on your agenda as well. And I do like to tune into whatever Johnny is saying. So from Social Talent. Um, but yeah, what a, what a great lineup. The timetable and the agenda look super. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to convening once more, Suzanne. And again, looking forward to seeing you, your team, uh, and this, uh, this, this global dream team uh, together uh, in one place. Uh, but looking forward to hosting all of our folks again on the 24th of March in the Convention Centre. Um, so we're, we're really excited for it. Um, and again, people can get more information on the website, talentsummit.ie. Uh, we still have uh, the last few remaining uh, tickets available, all the partnership pieces. Um, are kind of boxed off but uh, again yeah it's set to be a moment in time I believe and I think as we're coming out of um, I think this phase of the pandemic um, I think HR leaders have largely shown up when needed most and again they've provided a very human solution to a human problem uh, and again they've long sought this seat at the table uh, Suzanne and felt they were probably on the menu for a long time they now have that seat and I think a big question for the day itself would be, how do they sustain this momentum of change, of impact and influence beyond the pandemic? And obviously we're facing into geopolitical uncertainty with the war in Ukraine and so on. Uh, and we're thinking of them. Um, but again, it's uh, there's so much in flux, as you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, I don't think that rate of transformation is going to slow down. Uh, so it's a big moment, I think, in time for HR leadership to figure out what happens next. And again, the team of the conference is work in progress. And I think it's very much that. Suzanne, thanks for joining me. I look forward to seeing you on the 24th the Convention Center and uh, to unpack in some of this conversation uh, with the rest of our speakers. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for inviting me on to chat. I'm really looking forward to seeing you and your team in a few weeks. See you then, Suzanne. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, bye. Take care, Sloan.